Hon kan väl det här så. Good night, Apple, jag tänker så. Hej. Nej, jag är Apple. Jag kan säga, Chains hände på Horst. Jag misser en Don Kahneman. Jag har med Vlad en Alan Kahneman. Jag har så en en Alan med han är han är som att han är en gist en en här. Han är en vad här. Aha, det är jag säger to the dad. Chase, why do you hack? To the dad? Vad är det han är? Han är. I guess McDonald, Van Randall. In Rowardy, what's that? Carpenters. Yeah. Three. Three. And you're not going to get me to get out. I'm going to get me to get out. Take me out. Och han gör mig brunn kul jag och så. Ja. Gammal. Här va? Jag är så här. Kom jag så här nu. Han är fullt kan jag skjuta dig nästa. Jag är så kallt en jäkta hållkål. Southwest Marble. Southwest Marble. Jag är så kallt en kål station. Kärst. Jag är så kallt en hård och ärvås. Eller garlic? Åh, för att det är en garlic jag kan ta i. Mamma är det så... Det är en kejlis. Det är en kejlis. Det är en kartis. Det är en kejlis. Det är en kejlis. Det är en kejlis. Det är en garlic. Det är en kejlis. 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 Här blir garlic, garlic, dialekt, jag kan säga att jag har sett att det hon är Tonja, men jag har kortat bränna garlic, jag ser att jag har sett att det är obviously, jag har sett att det är bränna garlic, jag har sett att det är just det som jag har sett. Garlic mac. Garlic bread. Oh, garlic bread. Katun had a good munch of that. I sent him to it. Oh, Lock Harbor. Lock Harbor. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. I guess the bell garlic had a good chow of that. Oh, yeah. I think. Uh-huh. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. Den är inte jämst av det här. Är det så att jag har en riktig helgärlig? Tjej. Vad är din namn? Jag är Alan Cameron. Som jag sa tidigare, min bror var John Alan Cameron. Jag vet inte varför de kallade oss både Johns, men de gjorde det. Och det var en vanlig praktisk sak. Folk var kallade efter någon som har redan dött. Eller något som var kopplat till dem. De perpetuerade det namn på det sättet. Det var bara en gammal skottisk kustom. Jag vet att den familjen nära till oss, John Donald Gillis, var den äldre son. And the other son that came along was John Joseph Gillis. You know, they, yeah. So it was fairly common. Uh -huh. and, uh, but it does ca cause confusion, especially where John Allen became quite prominent. No yes. one, you know, well, what's his brother? What's his name? Well, another yeah. John. Well, are, you, are you sure your brothers, you know? Yeah. That kind of thing. But um, that's uh, the story behind that. But, right. So uh, you, you live in. Judy Brickdown. Judy, Judy, Judy Brickdown. But you yeah. were brought up in. Uh, well, Southwest Marble, that's Anglan Station. We left uh, Southwest Marble to go to get to school because yeah. the school was closer to Anglan Station. Yeah. So we moved there, and um, I guess we were seven years old or something. I was, yeah. and um, that's where we grew into our teen years and left from there, you know, yeah. for careers or whatever. Right. Uh, and then uh, I was asking you how you became familiar with Gaelic. Um, but uh, at home, you know, people coming in and visiting. Right. And um, they would speak Gaelic a lot, you know. It was all Gaelic, actually, most of the time. If, if there was an English-speaking person came in, of course, he'd speak English. But yeah. there was a lot of Gaelic going on. And my father used to go around, too. And I didn't mention that before. He used to go visiting in the evenings. And uh, sometimes you know, we'd go with him, Janelle and I. Uh -huh. And, um, of course, he'd tell stories and everything. People always enjoyed seeing him coming. And um, 
it was always Gaelic. He'd speak, and, and they they reciprocated the same way, of course. And uh, an interesting thing about it, and I, I think that, uh, like, it's they wonder why it's Gaelic uh, falling out of favor. Well, it's coming back now, but why was it weaker in some places? Years ago, there wasn't very much of a mode of transportation. Even if you lived four or five miles apart, that was a long way. Yeah. And um, where, where we were brought up at Southwest Marble, it was on the east side of the Southwest River. And uh, most of the people along that river there, they spoke Gaelic, Gaelic families, most of them. Not all, but most of the ones that were there. And um, when we moved across the river to get to Glencoe Station, it was a different thing. There were more Irish uh, people there. Like um, there was uh, well, the Morans, of course, mm -hmm. and uh, the Davises settled there, and uh, I guess the O'Connors, and there were many like that. And there was far less Gaelic. Mm -hmm. So the three children who were born on the opposite side, on the east side, myself, Jan Allen, and Marie, our Gaelic was pretty good. We were hearing it a lot more. Okay. But, and and Jesse was born there too, and her Gaelic is, is pretty good, but not. Not as good as Marie's, or, you know, she doesn't obviously speak it. I don't know if she probably couldn't keep a conversation going, but maybe she could, but it's something like myself, I suppose. But um, uh, the three youngest, there's very little Gaelic. They, they didn't pick it up because they weren't hearing it. Right. So we were picking it up once we were hearing it, and they weren't really hearing it because people who would come in, it was always English speaking for the most part, unless Sandy McMillan came in, he was a Gaelic speaker, and uh, a few others like that, but. Uh, the McNeils that come in, they were, they were English speaking. And John Guests next door, they were English, of course. And um, so you kind of got away with it with that. And at home, they spoke to one another in Gaelic, but uh, usually by that time you understood what they were saying. And, and when they spoke, you realized there was something they didn't want you to hear, didn't understand. Mm -hmm. And uh, her grandmother, her foster grandmother, we called her Gig, Mrs. McDonnell. She brought up my mother. She was her foster mother, just yeah. like her foster grandmother. She spoke a lot of Gaelic, and Gaelic. She was very comfortable with that. With that, and uh, she um, was a good singer. She was one of the, the Macmillan dancers, and it's from her that Jan Allen picked up some of his Gaelic uh, songs that he sing used to sing on stage. Mm -hmm. he kind of throw them in here and there, and uh, right. and some of the tunes. The fiddle tunes that we learned, that I learned later from books or saw found in books, I originally learned them from hearing her singing and hearing her mother singing those tunes. She she sang them to us. I'm getting off the track here, That's okay, but no. I'm rambling on. I hope not. No, but it's an I know interesting that perspective. when we were um, when we were small, you know, before we even started school, we'd be out um, outside in the evening, the summer evening. I see we enjoyed being out, you know, and do whatever in the barn and around. And uh, it was getting dark, and I remember Mama calling us to come in. Come in, boys, the dew is falling. You know, come in. We, sometimes we wouldn't answer. Oh, come on, where are you? She would be hiding somewhere. And then we'd, I remember her answering her. We, one of us answered her, well, we'll come in if you sing some tunes to us. Uh -huh. Which, um, well, you come in, I'll sing all the tunes you want, she said. Uh -huh. So, and we went, you know, and that's, she used to do that, and, and um, She'd sing like a yeah, it's like a dog, it's just just another song, you know, you're not gonna say that tune there. Yeah. And then she sang it like oh a melody voice, she sang it like oh a cool a melody. Jan Allen used them songs, you know, in, in the stage show, and of yes. course yeah. uh, it was from her and from her foster grandmother. She got them from her foster grandmother. Yeah. And uh, other tunes, um, the tune uh, that's known as Miss Drubbin of Perth, uh Gil Trubo. Today, they're calling it Kaun Krupa for some strange reason. That's wrong. Yeah. It's Gilly Krupa. Here, Gilly Krupa counts the ground, couldn't now the cootie killer. Gilly Krupa counts the ground, couldn't now the cootie. That's a lame boy or crippled boy in the glen yeah. looking after the sheep. Right. Kind of tells a story. It was printed, and it is Gilly Krupa. It was printed in the Metalla yeah. newspaper around 1908. Uh -huh. Or no, or before that, 192. I have some Mactala issues, yeah. and that's in it, the Gaelic songs, Gili Krupa. And um, it's, um, if people would study a little more before they start putting those things out, that Kaun Krupa is going to stick with that tune, because, yeah. but it's wrong. Yeah. Kaun, there's a Kaun Krupa, and of course there's Gili Kaun. So somehow people got that mixed up, that's because they're doing it by ear, you know, they're not yeah. studying the music. But um, that that's the way Mama used to, she do it, and you pick it up, Without even trying to pick it up, you know, yeah. it's just there, yeah. and uh, you appreciate that. And 
appreciated more now, you know, where oh, people aren't doing that. Uh, I heard the fiddler Bill Lamy say that a lot of tunes he learned, he learned from mouth music from the beginning. And that's another subject, yeah. which uh, is uh, Mama did, did the mouth music. Like those tunes, who knows if they were ever composed by a fiddler or, yeah. or anything else. They may have done with uh, just some of the Gaelic lyrics. In fact, yeah. that is mouth music, I think, I believe. Oh, for school, though. Okay. <laughs> so you had uh, six siblings? There were six in the family? There were six, seven, sorry. Seven. seven. So yeah. yourself yeah. and John Allen. Can yeah. you round them off? Myself, John Allen, Marie, Jesse, um, uh, Alec Dan, D.A., and Cyril. That's right. Yeah, so. Yeah. And the three youngest, you know, they didn't, they weren't into the Gaelic, and I don't know how much they understand it now. And, yeah. and to me, that says something on a small scale. Yeah. That um, if Gaelic is spoken in the community, it's gone, then you're bound to pick it up yeah. and uh, practice. And, and even if you, you speak, uh, like, I enjoy hearing people speak Gaelic, especially the old people. But their dialect may be different. And mm -hmm. sometimes in Scotland you hear them, it, it's, it's a different dialect, a little harder to understand, I find. Yeah. I find the, the Irish Gaelic is a bit similar to Kipraki Gaelic if you listen to it, uh, the Irish people speaking it. And uh, it's uh, actually the Irish Gaelic is the original Gaelic. The Scottish only evolved to the 1700s yeah. you know, or something like that. So it, it's taken on its own, you know, which, which is good too. But they're all brothers or cousins, oh, whatever yeah. you want to call them. But, you, but you're all your family members who are very musical. Uh, and, and I can see in every one of them in the dancing. Yeah. itself. You can mm -hmm. see how, how the Gaelic influences yeah. there in the yeah. dancing and everything. Well, it's unconscious. You don't realize that. You don't think of it that way, but yeah. uh, it's uh, it's true. I mean, uh, the Angus the Carpenter, our grand uncle, he was a good step dancer. Yeah. And we thought he was, and uh -huh. he was. And, and of course, um, um, Jen Allen and, and Alec Dan both, uh, they, they, they kind of picked up on his style. And D.A. was a good step dancer, too. Yeah. Oh, very good. Uh, yeah, so so um, I think uh, it, it was there. It's it's there. And it's hopefully you can produce it. <laughs> That's right. Well, uh, I know your mother was a very good Gaelic singer, and and Dan Ur, her brother as well, because I heard them myself singing at a at a party oh, in yeah. Glen Cove one yeah. night, and they were just wonderful. The whole thing, and uh, I'm sure you had a lot of singing in your household, like. When when people would come in. Oh, and, yes, yes. If there was, yeah, yeah. they come in just for that. But, uh, yeah, Mama was, uh, she was a good singer. She um, sung some Gaelic songs that uh, you don't normally hear now, like, oh, Hughes, no, Hugh nor Ayla. She, she sung oh, that yes. song. I yeah. enjoyed that song. And uh, many different songs, you know. But uh, and she had a good voice. Jen Allen said she had a voice remind you of bagpipes. Uh -huh. Come to think of it, she did. She had that way of... Uh, but um, Dan Ayer, I didn't know that he, uh, I heard him singing a Jimmy Rogers song one time. Yeah. Well, <laughs> maybe joining on the chorus. He, yeah, yeah, like okay. that, yeah, okay, yeah, he probably would. Yeah. It's only natural that he would yeah. be a singer, but uh, anyway. So, uh, when you were younger, uh, there was lots of concerts and, and things going on and dances. And yes. weddings. Oh yes, absolutely. And yeah. can you tell us about when you first started playing the fiddle? And uh, yeah, okay. How you got into it there? Well, we used to hear um, there weren't many fiddlers around where we were, of course. Uh, Red Johnny Camel down the Southwest River. Mm -hmm. There's several farms down, about a mile and a half away. He was a good fiddler, a storyteller, and a real Highlander type of person. And um, occasionally he'd, he'd land and we'd hear him he'd play. And um, then um, we went out to Glencoe Station for some one Sunday. My father went to go out there, so go over there somewhere. So we went across the river, horse and wagon, went to Johnny Mackay's place, little Johnny. And uh, my father asked if he'd bring out the fiddle, and he did. He came out and he played. And, we were quite fascinated with that, you know. And, How old uh, would you have been then? Oh, then? I don't know. We were it was before we started school. I guess about five, okay. something like that. Yeah. And um, we uh, quite enjoyed that, you know. So then uh, later on, 
we uh, got a, a radio. We didn't have a radio up to that time. We learned all the tunes we learned up to that point were learned from our mother by singing them. Right. Well, we uh, went to, a, as I said, we, to a little Johnny's, and he played for us. And uh, we got the uh, radio after that. Uh, father went one day, and uh, my uh, foster grandmother's uncle, or brother, was living with us at the time, too. He was one of the dancers, Alan the Dancer, and he uh, enjoyed music. And I remember John Allen went with my father to Marble, and they were going to come back with the radio, and my, I was kind of looking forward to it all day. And I remember Alan McMillan saying to me, how are you going to be f- have fun tonight? He said, they're going to bring back a graphophone for you. Graphophone, as he put it, something like that. It, radio was something not very well known. You know. So anyway, they, they came, and they set it up, and, and uh, we heard... Uh, I didn't really know what to make of the voice compared to that. Of course, at that time, you know, you needed a license to have a radio, too. And uh, so we they started to, occasionally you'd come across some music, and somebody came in and told us where you can get lots of music. And I guess it was C.J. Banks. We couldn't find them. So anyway, that's uh, what they tuned in, and Aganish, and uh, it, uh, we were hearing more music then than yeah. what we had heard before. And uh, kind of learning it that way and getting an interest. And then, of course... When we were, I was 13, when I got back at Bangor Station then, and John Allen was 12, and my father went to Port Hawkesbury and came back with a, with a fiddle one day. Uh-huh. Try this, he said. So, well, <laughs> Mama could play a bit, you know, and she she um, she kind of practiced up her skills a little bit and, and, and got us going on it, and uh, she uh, she taught us three or four tunes to start off. Good. And um, that's the way we... And, and we did take to it, both of us. A year later, John Allen got the guitar, so he kind of switched to that. And, uh, you know, that he still retains love for the fiddle music. But um, that's uh, kind of the way it started. And uh, you get interested, you know, and then as you start playing. And two years after that, we played for our first uh, dance, a high school uh, school dance. Was uh, your grandfather living at that time? No, he wasn't. No, no I, we never met. Uh, I never met my grandfather. And his name was? Johnny McDonald. Johnny Lespighini. Johnny Lespighini. He died in 1930. Uh-huh. And um, we weren't born then, of course. And, and um, But he had a very good name. As a, as a yeah, he did. He was just apparently lively. And yes, he did. And there's a couple of tunes he's recruited to uh, compose. So, you know, he... Um, he he's, everybody uh, heard... The, who heard him, who I spoke to, mm-hmm. they they thought he was a very good fiddler. You know, well, everybody's got an opinion anyway. And yeah. No doubt he was. I don't know if he, he probably played by ear a lot, mm-hmm. but he probably was a very good, lively player. And uh, I, uh, then I must have probably heard him. And mm-hmm. Do you he, remember the tones that you first learned? The oh, yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, Balkan Hills was the very first one. Oh, yeah. Balkan Hills and... Then uh, Prince Albert's Jig, uh-huh. and then um, the, the Gaelic one. Valentine <laughs> <laughs> Oh, we call it. You know, that was the, because we were going by the Gaelic words to it. Of course, know. yeah. And um, but and then and as you go along, somebody else would come up with a tune. But mm-hmm. but yeah, remember so you'd take turns on the fiddle. We would, yeah, that. yeah, and. Um, then we got the guitar, and then on the, um, there was always, you'd play in front of people, the, um, get used to it. We, we used the um, bridge and building cars of the extra gang, you know, the railway. Okay. They'd be at the station, which was only a short jaunt from our house. Yeah. And uh, they'd come over to the house, and uh, we'd have to play for them. And uh, then we'd go over there, they didn't want us to go over in the evening to play, which we did. Uh-huh. And I remember um, Lester Eager there one night saying, I say I want to just quit, you know, at the time. Oh, no, come on. He said, you, to- we, you told me before you had 22 tunes. I want to hear you play them. Oh. So, <laughs> so we had to play. And we, we enjoyed that. And, I, of course, that got us used to playing for people. Yes. And, and you didn't, you weren't really maybe shy in some ways, but not, not yeah. when you pl- picked up your fiddle and guitar. You, you weren't, you know. So that was, that was quite nice. Indeed. Yeah. So you played for... Uh, and concerts after that. Right? Oh yes, yeah, we were always the concerts. Uh, Port Hood and Junior. Port Hood, yeah. There, at that time, of course, in the fifties, there were no uh, outdoor concerts. No. 
they were all indoor concerts. So uh, when you went there to play, the place was full and the uh, hall. And then, of course, you had it was easier to play there because you had everybody's attention, you know, they were listening. And, yeah. and outdoor concerts, you know, they're wandering around and they're yeah. doing something. And some are listening, and probably 50% are not. And uh, it was always a little encouraging that way, and uh, yeah. enjoyed. And of course, we consider ourselves, you know, the young folks, the beginners, you know, and, and you admire the, the older fiddlers who come in yeah. to play. You'd listen to them, you know, you'd want to hear this fellow, you yeah. know. Um, 1956, I remember we played at a concert. His father, Donald Rankin's concert, uh, Pregnish Parish. He ran two in Pregnish, uh -huh. and they were successful, so he, so he took them to, took it to Andy Ganesh. To the um, parish center. That's 1956, and I remember um, Janelle and I told him well, we, we played at the first two, and, and he wants to come to, to, to and he said, Oh no, I don't think we can. We're getting ready for provincial examinations, Port Hood, the oh. academy. Yeah. We can't go. I don't think. Oh yes, 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 you can. Come on. No, no, no. Mrs. Albert, you know, Mrs. Janelle, she was the principal. She was our teacher. She wouldn't want us to go, and I don't think we should. We, we have to prepare for the examination. And anyway, that was fine. So then, um, oh, I don't know, about a week before the concert, there was a knock on the door of the classroom, <laughs> and the door opened. Who was it? Father Don Rankin. Oh. And um, he said, uh, oh, she made a big fuss over him, of course, yeah. me knowing what he was there for. And uh, talked to her, and he addressed the class, and he gave a he gave a nice little talk and he spoke in her. And then, uh, well, now he said, I want to see the Cameron boys privately. And oh. Oh, everybody looked, and my father and the teacher, Mrs. McDonald, looked. Said, yeah, well, go ahead, boys, go ahead. Father, you know what father says goes. Yes. <laughs> so when we went into the hallway, he asked us about the uh, concert. Well, the concert is, is next next week. He mm -hmm. said, I want you fellows there. And, well, you know, Mrs. McDonnell doesn't want us to be there, and I, I, we have to prepare for provincials, you know, which yeah. this was June, and we have to oh, prepare for provincials. I said, never mind, Mrs. McDonnell, I'll talk to her, he said. <laughs> well, if you want to talk to her, I said, but will you go if I persuade her? Well, yes. So I went back into the class, and, and I said, the father wants to see you up there, Mrs. McDonnell. Uh -huh. well, so she went out, you know, cranky look on her face. <laughs> and. Uh, Anyway, she was out about oh, I don't know, five or six minutes. She came back in with the cross look on her face. And she looked at Janelle and I. She said, He wants you to go to the concert in Antigonish to play, she said. And I said, He asked me, Will you let them go? And I said, Grudgingly. <laughs> said, That's the end of the story. But we went there, and really, the uh, performers who were there, you know, the, the, to us, they were legends. You know, Gordon McCory was there. Playing this the is Andy Ganesh, yeah. Andy Ganesh, we yeah. went to that concert. Gordon McQuarrie played there. Of course, Buddy was there, Buddy McMaster. Uh, Don Lang is beaten, Wilford Gillis. Uh, I remember Don Riley was there. Uh -huh. And um, and some Andy Ganesh. It was a, just a beautiful concert, you know. It was, uh, but John Campbell showed up, and his sister showed up, and he was playing a lot then for dances and that kind of thing. But um, it, was, uh, it was lovely, and, and one that I always remember. Yeah. In a nice setting and uh, nice, and then after we uh, finished, they, they sent us to a to a restaurant. We had a mm. little meal at uh, I guess maybe Wong's Cafe, perhaps. And uh, I remember Wilfred Gillis's father came in, and uh, he was in, close to his nineties then, I think, and a uh, very very dapper man, you know. Yeah. And, and he played the fiddle too. He did. Too. And Wilfred gave him a lot of credit for what he. Some of the tunes he played and that kind of thing. So, so really, playing the fiddle when you start out, you have to be encouraged. Mm -hmm. Playing the fiddle with anything else, if you're not encouraged by people like, yeah. like Wilfred's father and like our parents mm -hmm. and the people who got us to play for them, well, perhaps we weren't very good. I don't know. We we thought if they said we were good, well, maybe we, we thought we were. Yeah. And but since uh, got us to do those things, well, we thought, well, geez, that's good. There's encouraged us to, to go on. Yeah. And by going on and playing the fiddle, we're kind of carrying the culture along mm -hmm. and keeping it alive for young people. That's where it really starts. Yeah. If you're going to continue, yeah. continue, it has to be in the younger mm -hmm. generation. The same with now, you know. And like now, I, 
I'd like the young fiddlers to, to know more about the music than they are. They're just playing the tunes they're hearing. They're not, you know, if they knew more about the music, I think it would help perhaps the culture a little more. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, that way. That's not a criticism. It's just no. something that I think that uh, would be helpful. Is important. But yeah, there were a lot of uh, concerts and, and weddings and that throughout the. But you, you must have learned a, a little bit from your uncle Denar. No, very little. Was it okay? No, very little. Did Denar he was, stay? He stayed. No, no, no. Denar was in Windsor, Ontario, most oh, of the time. Okay. And um, he did um, came come home in 1954, and he heard us playing, and uh, after that he sent us a fiddle. When he went okay. back, he sent us the old. He got another fit violin, mm -hmm. so he sent us his old violin, which was, which was, was nice, nice, you know. Yeah. That was encouraging too, Indeed. for sure. Yes, he was. Supportive. But as far as uh, the music, no, he wasn't around to, to help us, okay. and uh, you know. And when he heard us play, and of course he started sending us tunes, some of his old compositions. Yes. Indeed. So you've done uh, some research and some writing yourself and you've composed some tunes as well. <laughs> Can you tell don't us say a little I, bit no, about no, 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 I, I, I'm, not, I'm not a composer, really. You know, it has to be in your soul. You know, you have to have that ability. It's separate from playing, it's separate from everything yeah. else. I admire people who can compose yeah. good tunes, you know. And, uh, well, Dan Ar was a great composer. Dan Ar was. And he in was. fact, you, you've written a book yeah. So two books about there. Oh yeah, the Heather Hill collection. That's the first book. Yeah, I'm going to zoom in on that. Can you hold it up? Absolutely. There? Yeah, a little higher there. Okay. Yeah. That's good. Playback, Papilla. So oh. tell us a little bit about how that book came about. Oh, well, after Donair passed away in 1976, uh -huh. my brother John Allen and I had a talk about the kind of protecting this. Well, not protecting, keeping it alive, keeping his music alive. Right. A lot of people were playing his music, but as time went on. Um, his name would be forgotten. The tunes would be there, perhaps, but his name would be forgotten. Yeah. So uh, we decided, let's get, let's do something and put some of his tunes to a, in a book and yeah. perhaps get it going with that. Well, the project went on for a long time. John Allen had somebody lined up to do it, and they with them, and they didn't do it. So I said, well, I'll take it on myself, and I did. And uh, I had to write all those tunes out by hand, and wow. and. Uh, Two of them that I changed the name on because Denar had the um, sometimes he'd forget he named a tune after something and then he'd name another tune after mm -hmm. the same thing, forgetting about the one that he composed several years ago. And uh, so I, I did that. There was a lot of work to it. And by 1985, the music was uh, done by a fellow in Goodwood, Ontario. Uh -huh. Music type. I saw. I found his name in uh, the uh, the uh, weekly uh, missal for the uh, Catholic Church where oh, I go to church. Uh -huh. The name was in there. Music by uh, from Goodwood, Ontario. I forget the music type limited. Goodwood, Ontario. Mm -hmm. He's a German chap. Played the accordion. So I uh, got in touch with him. He said yes, he'd be glad to do it, and, oh, and he did. And, and there were a few mistakes I made, and he corrected them oh, uh, musically, you know, which I certainly appreciated, you know. Oh. And uh, so he. Uh, so that was 1985. 1985. And then there was a, the next a one, sequel. Yeah. Yeah. The trip to Windsor was. This one sold very well. Yeah. The trip to Windsor came out in. Um, by 94, I think it was. Yeah. It was uh, finally done. I did that, and uh, that one uh, didn't sell as well as the this mm -hmm. one. And perhaps one of the reasons uh, the tunes are probably a little harder to play, you know. So, okay. but I like to get all of Denar's tunes in a book, mm -hmm. you know. There's over a thousand, isn't it? According to what I read. There probably are, but uh, as far as the books, I, I, there are several out there that I have other ones that are yeah. ready for a book too. That, but I don't think uh, nowadays people aren't, you know, they're reading, they're not reading music so yeah. much. They're, it's all by ear, it seems. Yes. So uh, there are a minority number of people uh, that Do read. you have a, a favorite diner too? No. No, I like them all. I like them yeah. all. They're yeah. all good. Oh, well, I know. They're all good. They're, some of them are better than others. And he, he'd say that himself. Uh, but uh, certainly well, he... Uh, Lime Hill Strathspey. Yes. Great to only post that in 1968. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, very good. He was working somewhere over in that area, wasn't he, when he wrote that tune? 
No, I was living in Marvel at, uh, oh, with my with uh, the sister, my mother, yeah. on the Highland Street, and Buddy Rankin lived across the road, you know, from right. us, across the street, from uh -huh. the same street, and uh, of course Buddy was driving the big trucks, Holly Pulp, and he asked him, oh, "Would you like to come for a day with me, a couple of days?" Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, he was glad to do that. Okay. So they went to um, this day. They were going out to Lime Hill there. And uh, I said, well, I've been around Cape Breton, but I've never been in Lime Hill before, he said. And uh, Denaro said, and uh, Buddy said to him, well, you should compose a tune for the occasion. Uh -huh. And uh, yeah, 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 maybe the next tune I'll, I'll call it Lime Hill. And sure enough, I, I was um, in Halifax at the time. When I came home on the weekend, Denaro said, I want you to hear a new tune I just composed. And the Lime Hill, like the Lime Hill Strasbourg. And um, he played it, and uh, I uh, thought it was quite good, oh, different. Good. And uh, he got that, uh, it goes off to a different degree in the second part, mm -hmm. which uh, he did in, there's another a jig that he did that with too, Jay Harper's jig. Uh -huh. But anybody else composed in Cape Breton, they never did that. Uh -huh. All other tunes have got, not done that, that type of a no. composition. So it was truly original. And uh, so um, I thought it was very good. And he told me the story about being over there with Buddy Rankin. Yes. And uh, so there are lots of little stories behind many of his tunes like that. Uh, some inspiration, uh, yes. hidden, you know, and somebody makes a suggestion. Yeah. And uh, it's uh, it kind of adds to the lore, and of too. Of course, the, they say the first one he composed was the Red Shoes. Yes, really? yeah, they say yeah. that, yeah. I guess probably it was. I always thought it was too good a tune to be his first, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's a great tune. I remember when we were kids, and we after we got the radio, you know, I heard it on the radio. Jim Allen wasn't there when I heard it. Little Jack McDonald had recorded it in 1935, I guess. Okay. And um, I thought, really, it's a good tune. So yeah. one day, Little Jack's recording came on, and uh, it was a Macbeth Strathspey and the Marcus of Huntley's uh, reel. And then Ray Chews, I said to Jim Allen, you wait till you hear the last reel, the third one. I said, you listen how good this is. <laughs> I didn't know that our composer, I didn't know our uncle composed. So when he came into that, Jan Allen was quite impressed. And, and we were, what, six or something like that, five, yeah. seven. And um, he, um, so it, coincidentally, later on, we found out Dan Arch wrote that. You know, we didn't even know him then. Mm -hmm. We did, didn't know Dan Arch at all. I didn't meet him until 1947 yeah. when he got out of the army. You know, he was a kid then, you know. Didn't even play, but um, it's uh, he yeah. actually was. I, I like I say, I always thought it was too good to be his first tune, but I guess it was. And, yeah, uh, just showing his talent right there. Yeah, well, once he learned to uh, read music and, and mm. study other tunes, you know, and he, yeah. he tried, like Henderson in Scotland told him, yeah. be original, don't don't copy of something else. Well, that's what he tried to do yeah. all along, you know. Yes. When he learned to get into other music and said, well, I don't want it to be like that. I want to be he a little different. He succeeded that. Yeah. And, he, you know, he was, he was coming from his soul. You know, yeah. it was really there. He had a talent. And uh, of there are others, Dan Huey McEachern, of course. Yeah. But back to the, the Glenn Cole Barks is, is a great tune, too. To yes. Do you, yeah. Is there a, a story on that? How it was well, yeah, he composed that. Uh, he went to a dance at Glenn Cole, Buddy McMaster was playing. Mm -hmm. And uh, he quite enjoyed the dance and the music and everything and when he came home the next day this tune came to him and said uh, the march and he wrote it out he yes. said I'm going to call this the Glen Cole March yes. so he wrote it out and then he took it over to the agricultural office for Catherine Campbell she was uh, the typist there uh -huh. over there typed the title on the top here and she did I'm going to give this to Buddy McMaster yeah. dedicated to him uh -huh. so uh, that's what she did yes. Glen Cole March and do you know, I think I think I was at the dance the night he brought it to Buddy. I remember yeah. him taking the paper out of his pocket you know. and passing it to Buddy yeah. at the dance. Well, Buddy was the first to play it around. He was the first. And, and uh, I remember I was in Newfoundland at the time. And uh, when I, I came home one weekend and uh, I was playing something for some, with somebody, the piano player was playing it. And she, she said to me, uh, what's the name of this tune? Everybody's playing it now. <laughs> Buddy plays it an awful lot. And she said she played it, Glen March. I said, I'm not sure. She had tapping on the keys like that. And uh, I said, um, I don't know. Well, she said, 
whatever it is, I hate it. I'm hearing it oh, so dear. much. <laughs> she was hearing it so often, you know. But I guess eventually it did grow on her. But um, uh, Buddy, of course, played so much, and, and he played that tune everywhere he yeah. played, you know. Uh, you were asking how um, how did I learn to read music? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. Well, you know, we're play playing about two years, and uh, we decided, you know, we could expand the repertoire a bit and learn some more tunes. And, uh, there weren't many fiddlers around, like I say, to, to learn tunes from. So anyway, we um, decided, my father was really... He really stressed that we should learn to read music. You know, my mother not so much, but uh, my father, yeah, he uh, he appreciated it. if you see somebody picking a tune from a book. He thought that was quite something, really. I don't know if it was or not, but anyway, the um, he decided to take us down to Red Johnny Campbell, our neighbor down the uh, Southwest River, and uh, we're at Glencoe Stage, of course. And we did went down one weekend and stayed there Saturday night. We told them that uh, we were there to. Uh, Try and learn the music, and he was more than helpful. He, he went and he got the um, Thousand Tune book, Cole's One Thousand Tune book, and um, took it out and started pointing out the notes and telling us. And then he wrote out the staff, you know, and put this is A B, you know, F A C E at the front, and uh, told us what this meant and that meant. And, uh, the way he explained it, I, we we picked it up in two minutes, really, mm -hmm. and. Uh, that was it, and, and he uh, got us started on it. But then, of course, there's there's more to music than just reading the notes. And then the intricacies of it you pick up as you go along, mm -hmm. and uh, you, you, like the sharps and the flats and that kind of thing, and, and the, the accidentals and the accents and that. Yeah. Um, that's a different thing. But we learned the bare bare notes from him, yeah. and it was it was good. And I, we haven't uh, I'll say we to Alan, who's yeah. no longer with us, unfortunately. But uh, I haven't, uh, you know, learned by ear much since then. It's all yeah. from uh, picking up from music. And, and your ear, anyway, you know, people say that'll spoil the way you play and keep repping stuff. It's not true at all because, you know, your ear, you've already absorbed enough in there to know what, what, what the keep repping sound you want. Yeah. You know, you, I mean, you're not going to start pick an Irish book and start playing it like, like an Irish fiddler might, you know. Mm -hmm. You won't play it the way Cape Breton, uh, you know, you, you, yeah. you, even a Scottish fiddler. We don't play the tunes the way they do. No. So, you know, the note doesn't spoil on your tile. If you have it here, mm -hmm. hey, no problem. So, we were talking about composers, too. You were going to mention Dan Huey McCaffrey. Yeah, Dan Huey. Others. Very good. He was, uh, yeah. he, was uh, he was very good. A good composer. You know, he composed some... He composed a tune for me, John Donald's March, and he uh -huh. composed one for John Allen at the same time. Oh. Of course, John Allen uh, stood the test of time. Still played a lot, especially by beginner fiddlers, so it left my tune in the dust long ago. Oh. But, uh, and he, he composed, of course, a snowplow reel and all kinds of tunes. This guy. And, um, Is that John Allen's jig? Yes, John Allen's jig, yes. Yeah. I suppose you play it yourself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So anyway, uh, yeah, then here we... Um, he was he was quite ill at the beginning of his um, you know musical career and, and he was in his early he was, he was late before he even started playing the fit play the fiddle and what a loss it would have been had he not played because um, uh, in uh, his sister told me uh, but uh, she was home from the states and uh, there was a picnic of some sort well a picnic in Judic. And uh, would you like to go? She asked him. He said, yes, so you can go with your soul. They went. And uh, Dan Huey was in his teens then. And uh, he was mesmerized by the, the fiddling that day. It was uh, fiddlers were Dan J. Campbell, Sandy McLean, and Angus Chisholm. And he sat there, and he, he was in heaven all day and listened mm -hmm. to that. And his uh, sister noticed this, how he was enthralled by the, the music. And uh, so she... Uh, Mentioned him on the way home. Would you like to be able to play like that? <laughs> yes, I would, he said. But I haven't got a fiddle. Well, she said, well, we'll see what we can do with that. And uh, she, there was an old fiddle there that she got strung up. Uh, John Willie, his brother, did have a fiddle. He played. But um, he strung up the fiddle. And um, Dan Huey had an asthmatic condition at the time, which troubled him for probably most of his life. And uh, he... Um, was um, 
he'd be trying to learn the play and he'd be struggling for his uh, to get his breath you know all that and eventually he, he did land in hospital with that condition but eventually I guess he kind of grew out of it and and it uh, it got better although he probably had a touch of that condition all his life and uh, he began to uh, of course compose then after learning you know he didn't have access to a lot of books and he had the ability to uh, you know to be able to come come up with something in his mind and, and the tunes he wrote they're quite original very very original they're not uh, and, and they're really um, they're becoming standards like Fraser's jig you know mm -hmm. they're standards in Cape Breton now everybody plays them and uh, the trip to Marble Ridge of course mm -hmm. and uh, several like that that are that, like Danar said, um, Danar used to give his music out freely. He'd write a tune, he'd give it to somebody, he'd pass it out. Yeah. And um, that way his tunes probably became more better known. Then he was less perhaps known because he didn't pass them out like that. Mm -hmm. And you can understand that. He did give them to a few people, but mm -hmm. and he played them himself. But uh, because of that, perhaps his, his, his compositions don't get the credit they really deserve. But... Uh, no doubt about it. He was a what a loss it would have been had he not learned yeah. to play. And uh, again, you know, he was he was influenced by hearing other fiddlers perform, right. and he it showed right away. So and and uh, other people that composed uh, tunes about you, uh, oh, John okay. Campbell wrote uh, yeah. John Donald Cameron's Fancy, yeah. and John Donald Cameron, yeah, uh, you said. Elmer Brian wrote a tune. Elmer, Elmer did too, real, yes, yeah. Real, real and Sandy McIntyre. Sandy, yes, indeed, Jig, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, Jerry Holland, I believe, did too. Uh, uh -huh. And um, Kennedy, probably Kennedy. Yeah. Anyway, um, yeah, you know John's tune there. Um, to he composed that tune. He didn't have a name for it, uh -huh. and he played it for me one time. And he used to call me a lot and play that. Mm -hmm. And I said, gee, that's a great tune. That's well composed. Whoever wrote that, he said, do you like it? I said, I certainly do. Yeah. And he said, well, I compose that. If you like it, he said, I'll put your name on it. Yeah. Well, that'd be great. That's so right. that's the way that... Uh, and he put it on one of his records. Huh? I believe he did. Yeah. There are others who played. It's a so, very uh, nice tune. Uh, timeless. Yeah. yeah, timeless, yes. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, so you were a member of, of the group that uh, was formed called the Cape Breton Symphony yes, yes, for a while. Yeah, Can you yeah. tell us a bit about that? Yeah, well, I, I never that? liked the name the Cape Breton Symphony, but that was there, and I, I, didn't, I didn't have anything to do with giving it that name. The name was actually given by Bill Langstrom, a TV producer. He used to produce the Don Messer show. Right. And uh, then, of course, Quentin Allen, my brother, his TV show in Montreal uh, in uh, 1970. Um, I, I was one of the fiddlers and I, myself and uh, uh, Angus Chisholm and Jerry Holland, Wilfred Gillis and Winston Fitzgerald who were the fiddlers mm -hmm. and uh, well, Langstroth asked, well what, what do you call yourselves? Well, we don't have any name, you know, just uh -huh. these can't, can't really be the Cape Breton fiddlers because there's so many, you know, yeah. people use that name so he gave us that name and I guess it was okay but um, yeah, they, they formed it, and uh, we had to, we did those shows mm -hmm. three three a month, right. and for thirty six seasons. You know, it was it was great. It was mm -hmm. a lot of fun to play. And then after, of course, the TV show was no longer on, um, we'd get requests to play. You know, so we got tours in Scotland, and we got yes, uh, playing in several uh, places. You know, that, yeah. that ordinarily wouldn't have gone That's to. You know. Nice. And, and it was a stage show, you know, you'd have yes. the, the four fiddlers. By this time, there were four fiddlers, most of them. That's what they mostly had during the time. And the piano player, the accompaniment was... Yes, Bobby, Bobby Brown, Brown, you know. He had a different style uh, than uh, the Cape Breton style. Where was he from? Uh, he was from uh, Scotland, yeah. yeah. Darren Shaw, I think. Darren Shaw, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Scotland. And, um, no, he, he was certainly... He, he knew his music. He was really sharp and... And he didn't hesitate at all to tell you, you know, that that's wrong, you know, you that's crap the way you play that, you know. And that was good. Yeah. That's what you know, 
yeah. you had to be told if you didn't know. You know, and he was um, very good, and, and we uh, thoroughly enjoyed playing mm -hmm. together. That you know, it was yeah. a lot of uh, companionship. But the, some of the fiddlers changed over the course course of the twenty nine years that we played. But uh, Wilfred Gillis and I were there throughout the whole time. The last place we played was in 1993, no, 2003, in Stratford, Ontario, mm -hmm. at the um, Stratford Festival thing. And um, we, uh, by that time, uh, Wilfred had died the year before, so just myself and Jerry Pizzarello, who was on the joint of uh, 1996. He was a classical player, but he played, also played uh, this old time style and plus Celtic, you know, right. very good musician, very mm -hmm. good. And uh, so that was the, it was a just a great time, great yeah. and uh, you know. And you toured with Jim Allen a little bit. We did a few know? shows with him, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, a few shows. Where did you go in the states or? Canada? No, not, we were down in the states, but on our own. I was oh, okay. there, but uh, in Canada, you know, the, the waterfront show in Toronto. There, I remember once we were there. We did uh -huh. we did several pieces there. And um, where else was it? Sydney, at the old Sydney Forum okay. with Huey and Allen too. Yeah. And uh, it was good. Uh, oh, that was a great show. That's a good memory, eh? Very good. You know, you met those people, you oh, know. Yeah. And uh, Alan gave me a nice recording of his, of the Rebecca Cohen in Halifax. Uh, they had a Cape Breton thing there, and Jim Allen was one of the features, and we were there, played, and uh, Alan, Huey and Alan were there, and. Uh, uh -huh. There's another fiddle, Mike McDougall played there. Oh, yeah. And uh, we had a we had nice yeah. It's the people you meet, too, you know, not just the musicians, but the people you meet oh, yeah. after the shows, you know. Exactly. That, uh, you know, you certainly enjoy, and I, and, that I miss now, you know. Oh, yeah. They always have a story for you or something, a story yeah. about dead hair or a story about yeah. something, you know. And I enjoy that. I always enjoy oh, those yeah. stories. And now, sometimes when I play, you know, I give, I tell stories like that because. Yeah. That's what so and so told me. Yeah. Kind of goes and, together. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, it does. So, I, I was wanted to ask you about uh, years ago you played for some weddings yes. when you first started playing. Mm -hmm. when you were young. Yes, we and did. And one of them was a wedding in Glen Cole. And I think I might have been present at it for Alec William and, and Teresa. That's right, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. You I, remember that? I do very well. Oh, indeed, yeah. very well, yeah. No, we went up early in the morning. We had a play in the afternoon. They had a um, stage outside, which was uh, common then. Yeah. A lot of, everybody did that. Yeah. And uh, they had a stage outside. And we uh, played there. And in the afternoon, the dance is set. And then maybe the rest of the afternoon, if there were people around, we played for them and whatever was going mm -hmm. on. I remember sister, um, well, she wasn't sister then, but Edna McDonald, my cousin. Yes. She was there. I remember sitting with her. She was standing alongside us. We were playing on the stage. And she asked me, do you think when you get older you'll ever go away? You'll ever go away. You know, like everybody was going away to Blind River or going somewhere then. Mm -hmm. And oh yes, probably I said. Oh, that's too bad, she said. You could <laughs> well we did go away, but it wasn't for that reason we went away because we joined a company that moved us around, you know. Yeah. And uh, the same with the uh, Jan Allen, of course, joined the priesthood after yeah. that. But yeah, we had a, a nice uh, and I remember the breakfast there at um, that day at Alec Williams. Uh, I remember Father Malcolm, he um, stood up and he gave a very nice toast to the bride. Yeah. And um, he, he uh, finished it off by saying something in Gaelic to Fatja uh, Riklach Kalli, the bride, and he raised his glass. And I thought that was a great moment. Indeed. Indeed, I did. Yeah. And uh, so I thought, uh, well, geez, you know, there's, there's something here. That, you know, that something we, special. There's something here that yeah. we have, you know, that maybe we should. You know, be paying attention to not take for granted. Yeah, for sure. So, uh, are there any fiddlers, past or present, that stand out in your mind? Oh, I think all, all, all fiddlers. I, yeah. I like that. I really liked Angus Chisholm's playing. Oh, yeah. You know, he's changed the tunes here and there, but um, Angus was a he's, he's, he'd tackle anything, you know, uh -huh. and. Today, you can see he still sees his influence. Uh, the young people are playing, they're playing, imitating him, a lot of them, because they're playing the same tunes in the same run of tunes, mm -hmm. as a group. And uh, they should do their own, but, but that speaks something for, for his influence. Yeah. And um, I, I 
really enjoyed listening to Angus Chisholm. And, uh, and he always gets something out of his playing. Yeah. He had that uh, something in, in his playing that uh, was kind of special, I think. Yeah. And uh, I guess probably uh, there are others, of course, too. Yeah. But uh, Little Jack, I really like Little Jack uh, McDonald. Mm -hmm. So I, was, I hadn't heard him very much, so I didn't hear him hear him in person until, well, he was very old, and mm -hmm. you know I, I was, you know, I guess the first place I heard him was in Alexandria, Ontario. Mm -hmm. He played at a concert there, um, 1963 St. Andrew's Day concert. I was in Montreal at the time. I was invited to come out there to play, so I did. And, and Jen Allen came along with me. Just had gotten out of the seminary, okay. and uh, we went there to uh, and. Uh, he was playing. So. so I'd like to talk now about uh, uh, the Gaelic language and the influence of Gaelic on the fiddle music. Okay. Can you uh, speak to that? Yeah, well, I'm taking off it in a different way than perhaps others are. Um, the um, the way I see the Gaelic in the music is, uh, I believe a lot of the tunes that we play were originally mouth music, course of view. Um, there's um, one in particular that's referred to as that, and it's, it's a common fiddle tune, uh, Donald McGuigan's Rent. It's uh, referred to as mouth music in uh, the uh, K. N. McDonald's uh, Gesso collection. And uh, it's uh, one of several, but, uh, but I think that uh, it started out as a, probably words added later, but started out as mouth music. Uh, you know, the um, that tune there. Well, there's, uh, there are um, words to that, too. Mm -hmm. And uh, another one, probably, that uh, would represent that, too, is the, uh, the brown-haired maid, you know, the key of G. That tune there. Uh -huh. You know, it's, uh, it's a good, lively reel. But I've never seen it attributed to any composer, and in a lot of the old books you don't see it in. Uh -huh. So I led to believe that that could be one that's originally mouth music, and, and maybe the words added, because there are words to it too. Right. And really, Gillicom is one, some of the words, but there are other words too that are added. And there are several like that, that uh, I think uh, they inherently, they're, they're Gaelic. Mm -hmm. And so when they're played, they have to sound like Gaelic uh, tunes, you know, because uh, that's an inflection of the words, you know. Yeah. And like the, um, what they call the cuts, which really triplets, they mm -hmm. call them the cuts, so here, uh, in the tune, that's the, the Gaelic brogue, you know, like that. Yes. Uh, it's the same thing. Yeah. And you're getting that in, you'll notice, if you follow it closely enough, you'll notice that that comes in sometimes where there's an R, you know, in the Gaelic, and, and it's, if it's a Gaelic word, it'll come in like that, like that. I think that's imitating that, yeah. and uh, that's definite uh, relation to to the uh, to the Gaelic. And I don't think um, they're saying that people who don't who uh, don't speak Gaelic um, can't do that. Well, that's I don't think that's right. People who who don't speak Gaelic, it's only because they haven't heard it, but they they have a Gaelic accent. They speak Gaelic. Uh, they, they um, speak English in a, in a Gaelic sort of way, if you know what I mean. Right. And uh, so therefore they're going to play the fiddle tunes in a, in a Gaelic sort of way too. Well, that's the way I see it too. And then there are other fiddlers that's more pronounced the, the um, Gaelic uh, way of playing it, like the double notes. Mm -hmm. But that's closer, I think, to the bagpipe influence. Right. Uh, like um, John Morris Rankin, he had a, I, liked, I always liked listening to him. He, oh, I too. enjoyed his playing a heck of a lot. And uh, his playing was kind of resembled. It, it didn't. It wasn't straight and across the board at all. It was picking up other things, like other influences, Gaelic and, and bagpipes combined. Mm -hmm. uh, Willie Kennedy, I guess, the same thing, and of course Alec Francis McKay, yes. uh, very much so. Mm -hmm. And that's easily known because Alec Francis was a very good Gaelic speaker, and uh, that I think would show up in his playing, mm -hmm. you know. And, and, but the tunes, I think uh, a lot of them came from the Gaelic uh, idiom. Mm -hmm. uh, Molandu, for example. That, that tune there, yeah. you know. I don't know if I'm sure. jigging right or not. 
But uh, that tune is also Gaelic, and of course, Miss Drummond of Perth, uh, which, uh, which is the title given to it by perhaps Neil Gow, but um, it's Gile Krupp on Siglan. Now, that might have been which one came first, I don't know. Um, I feel that uh, the suspicion that the Gaelic came first because the Gaos were known to have uh, taken traditional tunes and named from the cell on their own. And, and uh, that, uh, that might have been, you know, at the time, there was no copyright or anything back in the 1700s for that sort of thing. And people wouldn't know anyway. People wouldn't know. You know, you can tell them, play anything you want, now I want an Irish tune. They can ask the side in copyright, they can say, no, well, the producers, they don't know the difference. You know, if they or not, but but they are. Some of those those new compositions, they're still, you need permission to use them, you know. Yeah. So anyway, I think the Gaelic came through that way. And I suppose there are other ways if you think about it, but yeah. uh, that's uh, right. the way I see it. Yeah. So the ties are still pretty strong to Scotland, and, uh, you know, even after all these years, and uh, some people from Scotland come over here now to to learn from us, which yes. is quite a thing too. Yes, yeah. Um, you visited Scotland. Yes, times. I did. Yes. Can you tell yeah. us about that? Well, the first visit was on my own back in 1974. Uh -huh. I went over there and I, uh, Jan Allen was over there ahead of me. Him and Robbie McNeil were doing some research and songs and things. Uh -huh. And uh, so when I landed over there, I met up with them and we were around for a week or so. And then they came back and I stayed over. And uh, I got uh, in with uh, Ron Ganella, the fiddler, uh -huh. and uh, very good. Violinist, you know, of an excellent player, you know, four wires and you know, yes. very good. But he was—he took me around different places uh, to meet people. And I, I, one fellow I wanted to meet was J. Merrick Henderson, who Donair spoke so much of. Yes. He was uh, kind of Donair's main influence when Donair was over there during World War II. Uh, but he told me, uh, oh, he died two years ago. I'm sorry to hear that, because I had a, I'd received a letter from Henderson 1965 it is. I wrote to him and he answered, he asked me, he told me he was printing a new collection, uh, the Giant Imperial Collection, he called it, and he, he wondered if I'd get some subscriptions for him. So I wrote back and I said, yes, I, I, if I can, I'll, I'll be delighted to do that. But I heard no more from him after that. And he might have become ill mm -hmm. and uh, he died in 1972, but he was a terrific composer. Yeah. Winston Fitzgerald is the one who composed more of his students than anyone else. But he, he composed totally original tunes, not always close to the Scottish idiom, but they were musically perfect, I think. Yeah. And, um, of course, Ronnie Ganella met, uh, introduced me to him and, and others who, uh, who introduced me to uh, Alistair Gillis, a Gaelic singer. And uh, I met a lady from the Isle of Skye who uh, spoke Gaelic to me. And um, she told me in Gaelic uh, that I had... Uh, Gaelic Elin Skianach. And I said, uh, well, people came from, uh, yeah. I think, Egg, actually, the, the Camerons, I think, and yeah. that there was a connection there. Yes. But she saw something in the Gaelic, the way I was speaking, mm -hmm. and she, I guess she understood me. Her Gaelic was very, very good. But the way she understood me, she, she saw something in it that was, that she recognized, yes. you know, from, that wasn't hers. Oh, was, yeah. Well, anyway, so I met, and then the next time, of course, we were over there was with the Cape Breton Symphony in 1982. Okay. We played at, uh, we opened at, um, well, we did several tours up into the Shetland Islands and mm -hmm. different places and met a heck of a lot of people there, musicians, a lot of musicians, yeah. and uh, Gaelic speakers, of course, and one night in um, the, the Kessel, maybe, Kessel, yeah. uh, a fellow came up to us and uh, he, uh, Bobby Brown mentioned from the stage that uh, Wilfred and I could speak Gaelic. So this fellow came up, and, and of course we had to be on our keys and cues. And, and he spoke to him for about 15 minutes in Gaelic. Oh, wow. And he said that uh, he worked for the government, and he was going, going to go over to Ottawa. He was going to visit Wilfred. For, Wilfred lived in Ottawa. Yes. He visited him, and we had quite a conversation. Oh, good. And then, of course, at other concerts there, we met fellows like Angus Fitchett, a well-known band leader over there, and... Uh, Oh, many, many people from yeah. the, uh, Willie Hunter, he, he um, from the Shetland Islands, very good friend. He uh, composed the tune that everybody in Cape Breton plays now, uh, the uh, Cape Breton's Welcome to the Shetlands. Yes. You know. uh, he composed that for us, gave it to us. Wow. And, uh, you know, we made friends that way. Bert Murray com 
over there. He composed a tune for me too. And he composed one for um, Buddy, Buddy McMaster. And uh, he did, it's in a, it's got a print, it's in a book. So uh, there's always uh, a connection, you know, and, and besides the relative connection, you know, when we were in Fort William area, I was talking to people there. We found out my name, and we said, there are people in Cambridge, maybe we're related. Left the Loch Harbor area. Yeah. So that interested me, but we didn't follow up on it. But uh -huh. genealogy is probably a little easier to do over there than it is here. Yeah. But uh, I, it's, it's always an interest and a Indeed, yeah. great connection. Your work history, you you worked up in Dartmouth for a number of years. Oh, yeah, Dartmouth, yeah. Well, that, Was there any musical influence oh, up yeah, there? Oh, yeah. yes, yeah. Well, as far as the music is concerned, I think I played more in Dartmouth and Montreal and, and St. John's, Newfoundland than I ever do it here. Imagine. Yes, yes. And things going on, you know, St. Andrew's Day things and, yes, and uh, yeah. different things. And, and mm -hmm. Cape Breton Club in Halifax, of course. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I've seen. And then just, after you moved back here, you uh, you opened a music store in Fort Osprey. Yes. Cameron yeah. Music Sales. Yes, yes, yeah. And, mm -hmm. uh, well, we had to move back. Uh, my mother-in-law wasn't very well, so uh -huh. we moved down. That was available then, so I yes. took it on. Great. And I stayed there for 24 years. Mm -hmm. And so I met a lot of people that way, too. I bet you did. It was, um, you know, it... Uh, a lot of people come in and speak Gaelic to me. Uh, John Shaw, every visit from yes. Scotland, he come in. Uh -huh. The whole conversation was in Gaelic. Yeah. Jeffrey McDonald from here. Yeah. And of course, uh, yeah. he, uh, and all those people who spoke Gaelic. And some who were learners would come mm -hmm. in, and you could tell they were interested in it from Toronto or someplace, you know. Yeah. And they'd say something, and they wouldn't quite understand. I remember one fellow, they couldn't quite understand it. And I said, well, what did you say? And he told me. Well, his, oh, well, I said, this is the way we say it here. And they're yeah. So I repeated it. And he got started working on that. And he said, mm -hmm. I explained to him that there are different dialects, you know. Yes. Not one maybe you're taught in. It might be a little different. Though you'll pick up a word here and there. But there are different dialects. But to me, it was great to see younger people. And not just teenagers, but yeah. uh, people in their late 20s and that yeah. still interested and wanting to learn the language, yeah. which which is wonderful. And... Uh, Pete Warner, did he go in your store once in a while? He had a little music store too. Yes, it's his from house. his, it's his uh, stock I bought at the time. Yes, yeah. okay. Yeah, Pete. And Mary McIntyre. Indeed, indeed, yeah. yes. She Great did. piano player. Yes, indeed she <laughs> was. Indeed she yeah. was. Yes, so, uh, and then in Halifax, their daughter Sharon has a music store. There. Yes, well, they, of course, they've sold that long, yes. long since. Yeah. Yes, yeah. So you did uh, some volunteer work too uh, in Judic at the Jack Store, the storytellers. Camp. Yeah, yes. There's a um, we run those. That. Yeah, we have the Judic Historical Society. We run those little Kayleys uh -huh. in, in Jack McDougall's old store. Right. Um, we run it. The memory. It's an old the st storage. Jack had it, but it was an old coal mining house from Port Hood. Uh -huh. It was hauled up there in the 1930s. And it was eventually it was originally a store with McMaster McDougal, which mm -hmm. is McMaster. And uh, then Jack had it on his own, they moved it across the road, and that's where it is now. When we had it renovated, we had it moved a little back from the road a few years ago. I run those little calyx just to keep the uh, building, you know, Operating. prepped up and you know, things going. And uh, we try to have Gaelic singers there yes. and um, fiddlers of course and, mm -hmm. uh, and um, Country singers, if they want, yeah. if somebody wants to come and sing, but it's mainly a Celtic type. Uh, You're often yeah. the the MC. The yeah, I, I kind of I organize them and I, I uh, yeah. MC it too. And you play? What I haven't got, can't get anybody else. I do. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're we're hoping you'll play a, a tune here today. Oh well. After we finish the the main part of the interview, maybe at the very end we'll. we'll I'm not playing very time. much, but I, yeah, I'll that would be nice. Try something. So I'd like to ask you now. Uh, about uh, milling frolics that you might have attended over the years. Actually, Actually I never did, but no. I, of course, the real milling frolic, I don't suppose anybody that's alive today ever did uh -huh. the real milling fro frolic, but you'd see them on the stage, you know? Yes. And I guess um, the one I remember really is um, Judic, the old Judic Hall in uh -huh. uh, probably the 1950s. Right. Um, we were there and uh, they were up on the stage singing. Uh, I remember Hector Huey McDonald from Craigmish. Yeah. He was uh, 
to me, he's the one I remember. He was just lifting the cloth up so high, you know, he's going down like this. And he was a sharp man, too. Oh, okay. And it, it, uh, it was interesting. It was okay. nice. And, and, of course, to pass it on to some of the next one and go on with that. Uh, they're representing, you know. That's the way they beat the wool, I guess, or the cloth in order to uh, get it to, to where it should so be. So was that at a concert? Or it was a concert. No, it was at a concert. Yeah. It's on the stage. Yeah. Okay. And I guess there are a few others, too, but... Uh, not many. Most of the Gaelic singing that we did here were solos or little, maybe, a, a, you know, little in between a dances or something. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, you mentioned weddings before. Well, one wedding we played at in Craignish, was, we had an evening thing in the, in the hall there. John Allen and I were playing. Uh -huh. And um, I think Lorraine McMaster played piano with us. And um, during the, um, there was not kind of an intermission, Father Rankin came up. And he took some other people up with him, and they stood on the uh, stage, in front of the stage, and they joined hands and started singing, uh, what was it? They uh, start singing that. Yeah. I always remember that. There's always a, kind of a favorite song, too, oh, yeah. to, to hear. You know, so uh, these things go along with the whole thing. Oh, you know, yes. that's what I'm saying. The Gaelic, the music, and all this. The culture of the storytelling, it all goes together, really. It's yes. all one, well, one culture. Part of the fabric. It abso absolutely is, and people should, you know, foster that. Yes. March of the Cameramen, Cameramen, Jeff Aquas on March. And you listen, Jeff Aquas on March. It's called a so, what future do you see for Gaelic language in the years to come? Well, it's more hopeful than it was like when we were growing up. Nobody paid attention. Like, before we started school, I don't want to be using that word like too many people use it now. Uh, when we, before we started school, we'd hear uh, people uh, speaking Gaelic to her mother, you know, yeah. telling her, if you 
speaking Gaelic to them. Don't be, to, don't be speaking Gaelic to them, you know, because when they go to school, they won't be able to understand what's going on. Don't, don't speak Gaelic. And so they didn't. It was all English. I went to school, of course, it was all English, and uh, Janelle and I knew a few Gaelic songs, and we, we somehow or other we started singing them. And we used to sing, Shalom, so sad, or sign, or Yakum, in school. You know, they get us to sing that, you know. Well, yeah. They didn't hear young people doing that much at that time, but uh, I don't know if you say we're old fashioned. So, do you have any advice for Gaelic learners? Well, I guess really I'm a learner too, uh -huh. <laughs> despite my age. But uh, yeah, I guess probably uh, it's probably difficult to do, but if you listen to more of the older people talk Gaelic in the natural way, but there are fewer and fewer left who do speak the language. Uh -huh. um, that really is the best. Yeah. But uh, if you can get some Gaelic dictionaries, and, and there are some good ones, all right, T it talks about pronunciation, and, um, you know, that kind of thing. And even anybody speaking Gaelic, whether they have the, the old style Gaelic or not, anything like that would be good. And there are a lot of young people who are learning it very well. But really, to be in, immersed in it is the, is the way to, to go, I think, really. Yeah. To, to my way of thinking. It would be for me anyway. Right. Well, I would like to thank you, Nero Jindal, on behalf of the Gaelic College for uh, participating in this uh, interview project for the archives. And uh, we really appreciate your, your wisdom and your knowledge and, uh, and your musical talent. And uh, it will be of benefit for years to come. And... Uh, well, we'd, we'd like to thank you more than thank. Well, Tapolet, uh, you know, thank you for asking me that you think I'm worthy of, you know, contributing something that would uh, be in the archives. I don't know, maybe I helped, maybe I didn't. But uh, I do appreciate you asking me for sure. And uh, I'm glad to have participated. And thanks very much. And uh, thank you to yourself for uh, the way you're upkeeping the Gaelic and the, the music. And of course, coming from Glencoe Mills. <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, one of the places Janelle and I played in the old school there years ago, uh -huh. and uh, we uh, there's a lot of memories, a lot of uh, a lot of fun from back that yes. that area for sure. Indeed, play that tapalot.